Good evening. Tonight's story is The Yule Log by Jules Simon, as translated by Antoinette Ogden and published in 1893. This story is a personal memoir of Christmas in the author's childhood, so it is partly just a description of his family and the celebration. However, children often miss subtext and context that is evident to adults, so the other aspect of this story is demonstrating how this particular Christmas has significance for all the women in the community. It is a fascinating and moving depiction of a Christmas exactly 201 years ago. Now, let's open our imaginations and begin. Yesterday was my birthday. A number of friends who have never seen me wrote to congratulate me upon having reached the age of 80. They are mistaken. I am not as old as all that. I can readily understand that a few years more or less make very little difference to them, but they certainly make all the difference in the world to me. I am still far from the dignity of an octogenarian, yet I confess that I am very old, and at my age one likes to recall one's early childhood. It is a very well-known fact that old people, it seems that I am old, which makes me furious, and I really believe that I should scarcely realize it if people did not take particular pains, out of pure kindness, of course, to remind me of it every moment— it is a well-known fact, I say, that old people recall the first scenes of their life with marvellous accuracy. I have often heard Chevreuil speak of having been present on the Place de la Révolution at the very moment when Louis the Sixteenth was executed. His nurse had carried him there, the wretch. He neither saw nor understood anything, but he remembered the words of a garde nationale who scolded the woman for having brought a child to such a place. He delivered there and then a perfect sermon on the subject, he used to say, and I remember every word of it. But let us not speak of tragedies. I want to take you with me to Brittany, not without having first warned you against myself, however. You must not take me too literally when I describe the customs of that country. My descriptions are absolutely faithful, but they represent Brittany as it was from 1815 to 1830. I went back there this summer, after an absence of half a century, and I recognized nothing but the scenery. The men are all civilized, and far more Parisian than I. In order to reclassify them, I should have been compelled to drive them back to their national dress that they so foolishly gave up. I will take you back, therefore, to the year 1822 and you would not doubt it for an instant if you could follow me into my father's study. The walls were papered with Republican money. He had obtained it in exchange for cash, and when it turned out to be as worthless as waste paper, he determined it should be of some use to him anyway. I fancied that its usefulness consisted in reminding him of the fragility of human things. The walls were also decorated with portraits of the royal family, from the king down to Monsieur de Villers, all tacked on with pins. But these portraits were not to be relied upon, for when they were turned upside down, they represented, by some ingenious combination, the ogre of Corsica, the king of Rome, and the empress Marie Louise. They were suited to all tastes and all opinions. This extraordinary study was situated on the first floor, for our house had a first floor, differing from the other houses of the borough, which had nothing but a ground floor. It also had a slate roof, which filled me with legitimate pride. It looked out upon the street which circled the graveyard, and I will say at once, to be sincere, that there was no other street in saint jean Prévelay. This view and this neighborhood will not strike you, with your modern ideas, as very attractive, but in Brittany we like graveyards. I might even say that we like sadness. And then in this graveyard stood the church— an imposing church, I can assure you, with a vault upon which hell was faithfully represented on one side, and heaven on the other. Near our window there was also a great fir, which was worth a whole forest in itself, and which sheltered a formidable number of crows. If, however, in spite of this double attraction, one found no pleasure in contemplating the view from that side, we had another façade to resort to, a façade opening upon an immense and magnificent garden. There you might have looked down upon a patch of cabbage, 
a patch of French beans, of peas, of carrots, and of potatoes. We had flowers, too, so many flowers, so many vegetables, and so much fruit that we made gratuitous distributions of them every Sunday. Besides our apple trees, the branches of which bent under the weight of the fruit, we had pear trees, cherry trees, and plum trees. My father, who had traveled considerably, particularly through the South, prided himself upon his enterprising spirit. Every year when the plums had been picked, he collected them in great piles. From these piles the best were chosen, put upon a species of riddles, and the riddles were laid in the sun. This was with a view to making prunes. The plums rotted in a few days, the birds and other animals ate them, and soon there was nothing left but the stones. These were then thrown into the street, where we used to pick them up in order to make piles and stick a little flag on the top. The next year my father proceeded to make prunes in precisely the same manner. We were very proud of our rose bushes, which furnished roses for the altars, and of our apple trees, from which we obtained a most excellent cider. We had our wine press, our kneading trough, our oven, and our laundering basins. We had pastures for our cows, wheat fields, fields of buckwheat, and of rye. We sowed just enough to supply our wants. There was no mill in our village, so we were compelled to send our grain to pont de When it was ground, it was brought back and made into very good rye bread for our daily use. We also made a great loaf of wheat bread once a week, which we used for the soup. Every morning my father started out, gun on shoulder, for in those days there were no rural constables, nor gendarmes, the gendarmes were at Plumelech, and one could hunt all the year round. He came in at noon for dinner, and at six o'clock for supper. My greatest delight consisted in running to meet him and looking into his game bag. I never found any game in it, but it often contained a big trout or some fine eels. We eventually discovered that the hunt was a mere pretext, and that his real passion was fishing. He was extremely taciturn, as all of his children have been after him, and I believe that to be one of the most essential qualities of an angler. During dinner he never breathed a word. In the evening, at supper, he described the events of the day, when he had been lucky. We took our meals in the kitchen, which was vast and cleanly. There were twenty of us at table, and sometimes more, owing to the legendary Breton hospitality. The table formed a long rectangle. My mother occupied one end of it, with my sisters and myself. My father sat at the other end alone, while the two long sides were reserved for the servants. These were no less than twelve in number, the gardener, the plowman, the shepherd, the stable boy, and the maidservants. This will no doubt give you the impression of the household of a wealthy farmer or a country gentleman. Not at all. In the beautiful borough of St. Jean Grevelet, there was neither butcher, baker, nor grocer. The only merchants that I ever saw there were a mercer and a tavern keeper. One was compelled to send to Vin, seven leagues away, for everything, or else live like Robinson Crusoe on his island. I have learned since that the plowman, who was our first man, earned only thirty francs a year. I leave you to judge of the rest. It was a poor country, and one could enjoy all the comforts which it afforded with an income of 1,200 francs a year. One of our chief pleasures consisted in the care of our garden. My mother had a little bed in which roses, tulips, pansies, and daisies grew in abundance. She was particularly fond of mignonette and honeysuckle. The hedge around our kitchen garden was covered with honeysuckle, elder, and a whole family of sweet-smelling creepers over which the bees hovered and buzzed. There was seldom a day when we did not walk around the garden once, and that was quite a journey. We had another habit, which I do not understand as well, and which consisted in walking around Cola's field every day after dinner, that is, at one o'clock. We first went down a hollow road where the mud was not wanting when it had rained. The flowers were not wanting there either in summer. We walked under a real vault of them. This road led to the blacksmith's shop, where I always found something to admire. The great bellows, the incandescent iron, the sparks flying from the furnace like joyous fireworks. Next to the blacksmith's shop stood Marion's house, the last house at the end of the village. 
Marion was a girl of twenty who had lost her mother when she was eighteen. Everybody had advised her to go into service, but she had preferred to engage herself to my mother as a seamstress by the year. Her house, Marion's house, as it was always spoken of, belonged to her. It was not a great dowry. It consisted of two rooms under a thatched roof and a little yard where she raised her chickens. She had been warned against the dangers of living alone at her age and in a comparatively isolated place, but she was a fearless girl and somewhat unsociable. She had discovered, I do not know where, in one of the neighboring farms perhaps, a widow who was only too happy to occupy one of her rooms gratuitously, and who was a companion and a protection to her when she came home after her day's work. Cola's field began at Marion's door. It was surely not what one would call beautiful. We walked straight before us and got back to our starting point at the end of an hour without having seen anything but apple trees and furrows. On Sunday, when this task had been accomplished, we found Marion in her yard among her chickens, waiting to go to Vespers with us. I always took her hand, and she told me stories of pool piquets. I led a joyful life. My mother, too, seemed happy. Her chief occupation lay in nursing the sick, and her heaviest expense in providing them with broth and drugs. The latter were sent for to the druggists at Bignon. I had never seen a doctor until I went to Lorient to enter school. Whenever she had a perplexing case, she called my father into consultation. As he had been a soldier, nothing surprised him. His method was to bleed. He one day took to vaccinate the entire population, and succeeded in doing so by offering five cents to all those who consented to honor him with their trust. This philanthropic operation must have made a great hole in the household budget. We had a library which contained fully twenty volumes. My sisters spent their time in taking them from my mother's room, and my mother in taking them from their hands. There were Selina, or The Child of Mystery and of Love, Alexis, or The Wooden Cottage, The Helmet and the Square Cap, or Both Suited Him. We also had The Evenings at the Chateau by Madame de Genlis, The Yellow Tales, and Robinson Crusoe. I was, of course, not permitted to touch the novels. I was allowed Robinson Crusoe, The Yellow Tales, and The Evenings at the Chateau, of which permission I availed myself eagerly, for I was ever a great reader. Robinson Crusoe particularly delighted me, and I read it three or four times a year. I had also a tender feeling for Selina, which I only half understood. In the first place it represented the forbidden fruit, and in the next place it had pictures. I never got to the denouement, because my mother, seeing that I was incorrigible, resolved to burn the corpo del delicto. If I add that in rummaging through the closets and wardrobes I had found L'Esprit de Louis and an odd volume of The Political and Philosophical History of the Two Indies, and that I read them, you will no doubt believe that I am trying to make myself out as an infant prodigy. It was quite the reverse, for I preferred the Abbe Reynal to Montesquieu and what I was most charmed with in the Abbe Renal was some absurd rant about a mistress called Kachinka, whom he had lost, and who in some remarkable way formed a part of the philosophical history of the two Indies. This strange library produced a veritable chaos in my poor little brain, over which floated Robinson. It was the genuine Robinson, too, a translation of the work of Daniel Defoe, which, as everyone knows, contains as many sermons as it does events. But what I liked better than Robinson, better than Selina, better than my garden, better than the eternal walks around the Cola's field, was the church service on religious holidays, the pompous grandeur of its ceremonies. Yes, the pompous grandeur I will not retract. Since then I have seen St. Peter's, the cathedrals of Cologne and Toledo, and I believe all the finest churches in the world. Yet I never attended service anywhere without recalling the poor little church of St. Jean Brevelet. The difference between the palace of a king and the thatched cottage of a peasant is far greater than that between the august basilica and the poor little tottering chapel of a Breton village. May the artists forgive me, but a church, however poor and small, is nonetheless a church. 
Four bare walls, a wooden cross upon a table, windows so covered with dust that they scarcely let the light in, all of these things speak to the soul of meditation and of prayer. I do not know what the population of St. Jean Brevelet was. It could not have been over two hundred, but on Sunday the people came to high mass from the four corners of the parish, which was vast and populous. The farmhouses and thatched cottages all emptied themselves at the first glow of dawn. You could see the families making their way to the borough along every known road, the men leading the way in silence, the women following in noisy talk among themselves. They had first scattered through the graveyard, every family stopping to say a prayer at the family tomb. Then the friends and relatives came together in groups, and the men made more than one escape to the tavern. At the last call for high mass, they all rushed to the church doors, pushing, jostling, crowding one another, until the building was filled from end to end. The graveyard, I might say the burrow, was now a perfect desert. The men, standing and pressed close together, occupied all the front part of the nave, and the women, kneeling, filled the rear. All, without exception, took part in the singing. The common serpent was unknown to us, but with our voices alone we managed to make a formidable noise. The people were happy to be there, not because, as Voltaire says, high mass is the opera of the poor, but because, as the Christian church says, religion is the consolation of the afflicted. The rector delivered his sermons in Le Breton, and they were never anything but a paraphrase of this word of the gospel, love one another. And surely they loved one another, these uncultured folk. They did not know how to read, but they knew how to love. They understood gratitude, too. My mother was almost an object of worship. The great festival of the year, after that of St. Louis, was Christmas. The king first and God next, such is the order of precedence under all governments. It is possible that our poor peasants would have reversed that order had they been able to do so. I must say, in order to not give them more praise than they deserve, that what they liked best about Christmas was the midnight mass. A sorry enjoyment for you city-bred people who are fond of your comforts, but what is a sleepless night to a peasant? Even when they had to plod along through the mud or the snow, not an old man, not a woman hesitated. Umbrellas were then unknown at St. Jean Brevelet or at least ours was the only one that had ever been seen there, and it was naturally the object of much surprise and admiration. The women caught up their skirts with pins, threw a plaid kerchief over their headdresses, and started out bravely for the parish church in their wooden shoes. Sleep? Forsooth! Who could have slept even had he wanted to? The chimes began the night before, immediately after the evening angelus, and were repeated every half hour until midnight. The hunters, in order to contribute to the general beatitude, kept up a steady firing. My father furnished the powder. It was a universal and deafening clamor. The small boys took part in it, too, at the risk of maiming themselves whenever they could lay their hands on a gun or a pistol. The vicarage was a short half-league from the borough. The rector came over on his nag, which the quinquis, the beetle, led by the bride. A dozen peasants escorted him, firing their pistols in his ears all the while, but this did not disturb him in the least, for he was an old chouan, with the death of many a blue on his conscience, withal the kindest and most compassionate of men since the king had returned and he had become a priest. On that night great preparations were made at home. Téline Charles and Les Halico measured the fireplace and the kitchen door with as much earnestness and importance as though they had not known their dimensions by heart for many years. The question was to bring in the Yule log and to have it as large as possible. A great tree was felled for the purpose, four oxen were harnessed, and the log was dragged to the house. It took eight or ten men to lift it and to carry it in. It would scarcely fit in the fireplace. Then it was adorned with garlands. It was propped and stayed by the trunks of young trees, and an enormous bunch of wild flowers, or rather of live plants, was placed on top of it. The long table was removed from the kitchen. We took our light meal standing. The walls were hung with white tablecloths and sheets, just as they are at Corpus Christi, and upon them were pinned numerous drawings done by my sister Louise and my sister Hermione, the Virgin, the Christ Child, etc. 
There were inscriptions, too, at Homo Factus Est. All the chairs were removed to make as much room as possible for our visitors, who were not accustomed to sitting on anything better than their heels. One chair was left for my mother, and one for my Aunt Gabrielle, who was treated with much deference on account of her eighty-six years. She was the one, my children, for stories of the terror. Everybody around me knew many such stories for that matter, my father particularly, if only he had chosen to speak. He had been a blue, and his obstinate silence was no doubt due to prudence in a part of the country that was so full of chouans. The confusion was such in the kitchen, with everybody wanting to be useful to carry in branches of fir, of broom, and of holly. The noise was so deafening on account of the hammering of nails and the rattling of pots and kettles, and then there came such a clamor from without, ringing of bells, firing of guns, songs, conversation, clatter of wooden shoes. It seemed like the din of a fair at the very climax of its animation. At half-past eleven, the cry, Et trou person! Et trou person! The rector! The rector! resounded all along the street. It was taken up in the kitchen, and all the men started out immediately. The women alone remained with the family. When the rector reached our door, there was a moment of profound silence. He dismounted. It was I who had the honor of holding his nag by the bridle. That is, I was supposed to do so, but somebody always did it for me. Heaven knows there was no need of holding the poor beast anyway. Monsieur Mosrin walked up three steps to the landing, turned toward the crowd that stood below him, hat in hand, removed his own hat, and said, after making the sign of the cross, Angelus Domini Nuntiavit Mariae. A thousand voices responded. When the prayer was over, he entered the house, spoke cordially to my father and mother, to Monsieur Ozon, the mayor, who had just arrived from Pénic Pichon, and to Monsieur Ruello, the blacksmith, who was also the justice's clerk. Then he proceeded to the benediction of the Yule Log. My father and mother stood on the left-hand side of the hearth. Those women, whom their importance or their intimate terms with the family permitted to remain in the sanctuary, which in this case means the kitchen, knelt in a semicircle around the hearth. The men were crowded together in the hall, the door of which was left open, and they overflowed into the street as far as the graveyard. Every now and then a woman who had been detained by some domestic care cleft the crowd and came forward to where the others were kneeling. Aunt Gabrielle, arrayed in her mantle, which always bespoke a solemn occasion, knelt in the middle of the semicircle, directly in front of the yule log, with a holy water basin and a branch of box beside her. She started a hymn, which all the assistants repeated in chorus. I have forgotten the words of that hymn, and I really regret it. The air was monotonous and plaintive, like all those that were sung at our firesides. However, it contained a crescendo at the moment of benediction, which generally sent a shiver through me, producing what is commonly known as goose flesh. Aunt Gabrielle had just reached that part of the hymn on the 25th of December, 1822, when I became aware of a strange confusion among the male voices outside. The women either stopped singing entirely, or sang out of time and tune. Their voices chased after one another, scarcely sustained themselves, and seemed stifled by a sudden emotion. My mother's hand, which held mine, trembled for a moment, then grew firm by a great effort of her will. Her voice rose, soared above the voices of the others, who, realizing at once that they had wandered inopportunely, hurried back to the fold, and so the hymn ended in good order after this surprising interruption. What had happened? Something very simple indeed. A young woman had made her way through the crowd, had entered the kitchen, and, apparently anxious to remain unnoticed, had fallen on her knees at a little distance from the others, and buried her face in her hands. I recognized her at once. It was Marian, my favorite, the best seamstress on the place, and the prettiest girl in the borough. I would surely have run forward to kiss her, but for the solemnity of the occasion, which forbade me leaving my place or making a noise. She was weeping bitterly. Why are you weeping, my sweet Marian? I was wild to have the ceremony end that I might find out from her. All the other girls seemed embarrassed. 
My mother alone, whom I looked full in the face, appeared calm, but her face lied. I knew it by the trembling of her hand. After the benediction of the Yule log, it was the custom for all the women present to kiss my mother before proceeding to the church. They came up in good order, one after another, and in spite of their number, which amounted to some thirty or forty, this formality only required a few minutes. I think that my mother yielded to it rather in spite of herself, for she was an extremely reserved woman, but all these kind souls would have believed that the laws of the universe had been reversed if this part of the ceremony had been left out. As mistress of ceremonies, and on account of her great age, Aunt Gabrielle opened the march. Now, Aunt Gabrielle was a character. She was the living repertory of folk songs, legends, and customs. People came from everywhere to consult her when they wanted to know how such and such a thing should be done. Perhaps you believe that etiquette is peculiar to palaces. Most assuredly not. In my day, a wedding had more than a thousand equally important formalities. My good aunt, who was the oracle of these forms, had never made use of them for herself. She was an old maid, born at belle Ile en mer under Louis the Fifteenth, and was a distant cousin of ours. We have relationships in Brittany which can be expressed in no language they are so remote. My father, who never thought of himself until everybody else had been provided for, had brought out a whole tribe of poor relatives with him to St. Jean Brevelet. I think, however, that Aunt Gabrielle was an exception. She gave more than she received. She was our cook, I beg you to believe, and a most excellent one, too. She was active, laborious, always equal to the expedience of her profession, always bright and contented, full of delicate attentions for everybody, particularly for Marguerite, my mother, her best beloved. But my good mother was everybody's best beloved. I have never in my life known a woman to be so universally cherished. Aunt Gabrielle had only two faults. She spoiled children horribly, and she gave the poor whatever she could lay her hands on. It often happened that after a too liberal distribution of supplies among her beggars, she would set before us at dinner a dish so ridiculously out of proportion to the requirements of our appetites that she would herself burst into a laugh as she looked at it. We all joined in the laugh, which seemed to make us forget how hungry we were. She was the factotum of the house, and was just as exacting and despotic as she was kind. On that night she was greatly excited, and when she came up to kiss my mother, instead of folding her in her arms as she was in the habit of doing, she whispered something to her with an expression of importance and anger. "'Calm yourself, Gabrielle. Calm yourself,' my mother said to her several times, and I felt her hand tremble. "'No, my dear, I cannot help it. And if you do not choose to do it, I will do it myself.' "'You will do nothing of the sort.' said my mother, and you will remember that I am the mistress in my own house. She pushed her gently that the others might move along, but Aunt Gabrielle joined the women who were going out, several of whom stopped to speak to her. They were all making gestures of indignation as they looked at poor Marion, who had withdrawn into the darkest corner of the hall, and there stood with her head down and her face turned away from them. Finally, they seemed to have taken a resolution, and they moved toward her as though to drive her away, but they were stopped by these few words uttered in a low tone, and at which all the conversation ceased at once. Come to me, Marian. Marian started as though she meant to spring forward, but she checked herself and crossed the room slowly with hesitating steps. My mother kissed her on both cheeks just as she had kissed the others. I realized that she was performing what she considered a duty, and that she too greatly disapproved of my poor friend. Gabrielle held up her arms in horror. Do not dare to come to work tomorrow, she cried aloud, for you will never work for us again. I discharge you, do you understand? She understood it but too well. It was as though she had just heard her death sentence. There was no house but ours where she could find work as a seamstress and to discharge her was like condemning her to starvation. My mother's voice was heard again, low, but full of gentle firmness. Tomorrow, Marian's work will be taken to her at her own house. I will not be the one to take it, cried.
cried Aunt Gabrielle, whose words produced a murmur of approbation. "'Then I will take it myself,' said my mother, "'if I can find no one to obey me.' Marian had disappeared. There were only a few women left. Their cheeks were aglow with anger. The resin canned dyes had been put out. The room was lighted by the Yule log only, which blazed in the fireplace. "'Let us go and pray God,' said my mother, slipping her arm through that of Gabrielle, who protested and submitted at the same time, and kissed my mother fully ten times before we reached the church. The church was dazzling, for the simple reason that, as there was no way of lighting it, no lamps of any description, every faithful was requested to bring a light with him. There were surely a thousand persons in the building, which represented a thousand lights. I will confess that these were neither lamps, nor tapers, nor even vulgar tallow candles. They were mere wax lighters, which, singly, you may despise as you please, but which, multiplied thus, formed a luminous floor under the dark vault. When you looked down, it was joyous, dazzling, and when you looked up, it was appalling. The altar fairly glittered. All of our candles figured there, in addition to those which belonged to the church. There was just room enough between the lights for the chalice and the missal. The rector was arrayed in a fine scarlet chasauble, a bit worn and faded, which had survived the revolution. The mayor occupied the seat of honor, wearing the dress of the Breton peasant, blue vest embroidered in red and yellow silk, with a splendid sun in the middle of the back. Beside him sat the deputy mayor, Monsieur Adelis the miller of Cairdroguin, and both wore white silk sashes which covered their breasts and stomachs. The blacksmith was there too, in his quality of justice's clerk, wearing the black gown and cap of the magistracy. Monsieur de la Goublet, the justice and chevalier of Saint-Louis, had been detained in his chateau of Cairnec by the gout. But we had a corporal of gendarmerie opposite the altar, and two gendarmes on either side with yellow shoulder belts. Plumelec, where they lived, would have gladly enough kept them at home on such an occasion, but St. Jean Prevelet was the chief town of the canton. At the appearance of the celebrant, the corporal cried out, Gendarme, hands to your sabres! Whereupon the music, consisting of a fife and a drum, filled the church. That was the supreme moment of my life. I conquered sleep so as not to miss it. I thought of it through the whole year. You will not wonder, therefore, when I tell you that I forgot all about Marian from midnight until about two o'clock. Everything was over by two o'clock. The fife and drum had escorted the priest to the rectory, the quinquis had put out the lights on the altar, and as all the faithful had blown upon their meager luminaries, the church was completely dark. In a few moments it was deserted, and not a sound was to be heard save that of the swaying pendulum. On the other hand, the graveyard was crowded. If it happened to be raining or snowing too hard, the people took refuge in the houses, but they gave this proof of weakness only when they could no longer hold out. The taverns were overflowing with customers. Some people stood a little table out at their door, and upon it they placed a loaf, a sevrelas, and numerous bottles of cider, thus defrauding, in connivance with the authority, the tax on consumable commodities. At three o'clock the bells rang for the Mass of the Aurora. After the ceremony, our people came for us and awaited us at the church door with a huge red cotton umbrella, which did us as much honor as the same utensil does a Roman cardinal. We were also provided with an extra pair of wooden shoes half filled with warm ashes. We hastened home, exchanging courtesies with all, but stopping with no one, for there was a Christmas supper in our kitchen, a supper to which all our friends were invited, and besides them all the servants who had been present at the blessing of the Yule Log. During midnight mass the great kitchen table had been replaced by boards laid as evenly as possible upon props. They were covered by a cloth of dazzling whiteness, the pride of my poor mother, who used to bleach it on the grass of our meadow. On this occasion we had candles on the table, real candles of seven to the pound, which were sent for a week beforehand to Vin. We considered our menu decidedly sumptuous. We had buckwheat pancakes, accompanied by numerous pots of cider and the most delicious butter. 
After that, we were helped to a porringer of the very worst chocolate that was ever manufactured by a country grocer. We tried to convince ourselves that this course was excellent. It had to be served on that day, and to be drunk, and to be praised, but then we had the pleasure of feeling that we should not be called upon to repeat the sacrifice for a year. We also had a home-cured ham and rye bread. Everybody stood up during the Benedicte, and then those who found room on the benches sat down. The others helped themselves over the heads of those privileged ones and took their share out onto the street with them. The assailants succeeded one another until the table was cleared. Everybody was cheerful and contented. There was never a man who forgot himself. These peasants, who had no breeding, were by nature well-bred. Then they all loved one another in that country of poor people, and above all, may I be allowed to say it, the thought is so pleasing to me in my old age, they all loved us. I never remained until the end. I merely stepped in to get a peep at the beautiful celebration and to fill my eyes and my imagination with it. On the night to which I refer, I managed to stay down longer than usual. I looked for Marian everywhere. There were others, too, who were looking for her. My mother's conduct had been criticized and rather disapproved of, for these were simple folk, virtuous themselves and pitiless to others. If Marian had been brutally discharged, they would have applauded. Now they believed her to be forgiven, and they felt her forgiveness to be, in a measure, an encouragement to vice. And Gabrielle had found time to speak to the rector. To excuse Marguerite, she said, but, without realizing it, she had merely expressed her disapprobation. I not only remember all these details after sixty-five years, but I remember the room in which the scene took place. I can evoke the faces and the attitudes, the saintly protectress, somewhat moved but very resolute, the rector, restless and anxious, Gabrielle and her confederates, pitiless in their censure. Although not a word had been uttered in my presence concerning the nature of Marion's fault, I had understood it all, thanks to Selina, no doubt. It is useless to state which side my heart was on. The priest was anxious above all things to preserve in our parish those rigid customs for which we were famed. A moral plague must be treated just like a physical plague, with heroic remedies, said he. We must be charitable, said my mother. Our God is a God of charity. The priest was of the opinion that the sinner should not, under any consideration, be allowed to come back to the house and work among the maidservants. Why, of course not. I never thought of such a thing, said my mother, in that sweet voice of hers that reached one's soul. We must make this an example, a warning for our girls. I will see to that, never fear. I am just as anxious about it as you are. She will live alone with her child. I did not care to crush her under the weight of public anathema, nor would I be so inexorable as to condemn her to mendacity or debauch, that is all. I said to my poor Gabrielle, who was so ungovernable tonight, she added, smiling, that I would take her work myself if I found nobody to obey me. But that is not exactly what I meant. What I meant was this. I will go to her myself. I will go every day. I will assume, or rather enroach upon, your rights. I will exhort, I will preach to her. I will make her see that she is among sisters whom her conduct has grieved, but among sisters nevertheless. She said all of this with kindness, simplicity, and firmness. The priest lifted his broad-brimmed hat from his head. I uncover my white hair before you, madame, said he in a loud voice, and I pray God to bless the task that you have undertaken for his sake. My children, Marion will come back and work among you when she has made atonement for her fault. Until then, I leave her entirely in your mistress's hands. If she does not lead her back to the path of virtue, we priests will have to give it up. Our Latin will not help us out of it. This very mild pleasantry excited much admiration, as did everything that fell from those venerable lips. For my part, I was delighted, having a confused impression that we had gained a great victory, and I ran off to bed after having kissed my mother with unusual tenderness. You guys! 
A few weeks ago, I read on this channel The Christmas Log, a spooky Christmas legend from early 19th century Brittany. And here, in a completely different book, is the historic counterpart of that same story in The Yule Log, a historic and factual account of a Christmas in the exact same time and place. What an amazing coincidence! I really love this story. I love how much he loves his family and his community and his childhood. I love how rich and complex these descriptions are, how he lingers over all the details and he paints this deeply immersive image of his life in this tiny village. I love all the details, how much they paid the plowman, where they sent their grain to be ground, what the mother grew in the garden. And of course, I love his family. The portraits he paints of his mother and of Aunt Gabrielle are just magnificent. His mother speaking firmly while her hand trembles. Aunt Gabrielle giving away all of the food to feed the family. His father pretending to hunt while he secretly fishes. These are all just wonderful people. The kind of people you want in your life and in your community. Especially, of course, if you are a young unwed mother with no family and no resources. Bless them. Finally, of course, you know I love that this story happens in a real place and I can look up maps and images of the town, the church, the landscape. The church dates back to the 15th century, although it was rebuilt and modified in 1885. I love that this all kind of dovetails into the research I did a couple weeks ago for the other story. St. Jean Brevelet is only about 20 kilometers from Elvain. Better pronunciation this time. Thank you. And of course, I Google walked the town and I looked for the house. Today, the church is not surrounded by the graveyard. The graveyard is up the road and the church is surrounded by, of course, a parking lot. There are a number of old houses on that square, but none of them stand out as being like the house. And of course, the biggest difference in modern St. Jean Brevelet is the very prominent Rue Jules Simon. For the little boy in this story, grow up to be somebody. Jules-François Simon was a French philosopher and a statesman, and he was the Prime Minister of France, although that wasn't the title at the time, from 1876 to 1877 during the turbulent Third Republic. He was very moderate and he was pro-democracy. He served briefly in the National Assembly in 1848, but he was then expelled for refusing to swear allegiance to Louis Napoleon. After Napoleon III was deposed, Simon returned to government, and he really fought fiercely to oppose the restoration of a monarchy and to remain a republic. Um, his administration was really short-lived because he was kind of a left-of-center moderate. He could never get the full support of either the right or the left or the clergy. So he left government, but he continued to be incredibly influential over French politics as a journalist, as a newspaper editor, as a political activist, as an organizer. He died in 1896 at the age of 81. I suspect that this story is extracted from his memoirs of 1889 when he would have been, as he sharply points out in the introduction, not yet 80 years old. As you already know, if you listen all the way to the end of the video, you hear me make a little confession. This week's confession is that it is not this week's confession. I am working a little bit ahead and I just finished recording Eleanor's Christmas. I want to uh, finish this video and schedule it to go live so I can focus on other things over the next couple of weeks. I feel like I have a thousand things to do. I'm trying to cross them all off my list so I can properly kind of get into the holiday spirit. What I want to be doing is drinking mulled wine. You know, I went to the Christmas market in Liège last weekend, and although there were a million lovely things to eat and drink, somehow I couldn't find glue wine anywhere. Anyway, I want to be drinking mulled wine and looking at Christmas lights, but somehow instead I'm like calling garbage companies and internet providers. But recording for this channel is by far my favorite thing on my to-do list, and I am so grateful to share these stories and this season with you guys. This is Restored Lore, where we seek out weird, fun, interesting old stories and share them every week. If you are new around here, then you need to be sure to click like and subscribe and choose notifications. It helps the channel grow, but it also helps you get cool old literature in your timeline every week, and you don't want to miss it. 
Thank you so much, everybody. Merry Christmas, and I will see you in the new year.